more. Thank you all for your uh, patience. I got a little confused by what was up there. So right now, uh, please join me in welcoming to, me, to my immediate left, Areya Zhao, co-founder and managing partner, Base 10 Partners, Kirsten Green, founder and managing partner, Forerunner, and Aileen Lee, founding, founder and managing partner of Cowboy Ventures. Thanks so much for being here. Well, as you as you could tell from my from my ill-fated poll question, um, <laughs> I really am, I'm very interested in your outlook for IPOs. Um, as we head into the end of the year, we had a really great start with some big names like Reddit. We'll be talking to Steve a little bit later. Rubrik making their debut. But when you look at the first quarter in total, it was actually lower than a year earlier, which was not a great, which was not a great year. At this pace, 2024 would be the weakest since 2017. Aileen, I'll start out with you. I realize your focus is on early stage. I just want to hear your outlook for exits. And when you think about what's weighing on ECM right now, how much of it is the election? How much of it is geopolitical? How much of it is just those persistent yeah. interest rates? Well, I'll, I'll start with this dad about it. I mean, it, um, a lot of it is they don't need to go public, right? And why would you go public in this market where multiples are where they are? I mean, we had basically a historic amount of private money raised in 2021 and 2022. And so you've got folks who basically raised seven, eight years of runway. So why go public in 24 if you could maybe wait and see how you're going to, because obviously the amount of cash that you raise is going to be different and how you're going to be valued is going to be different if you wait until 25 and 26. The election. Everyone we talk to says the election is an overhang. Why, Kirsten, I'll go with you. Why, why is that? And, and what are people waiting to find out? Actually, I think if you look historically, the market right before elections is some of the most robust times. Maybe that's because a bunch of companies are trying to get out before an election and before things change. But at this point, um, there is something big every year, whether it's something that's planned or it's something that just <laughs> happens to us. Yeah. So I think people need to kind of put that aside and be more focused on what's happening with their business and what's the outlook for the business and let that rule the day. Um, I think Aileen's absolutely right about people not feeling pressure because of their own balance sheets to go public. But at the same time, I, I do think that one of the goals here is to build long-term durable companies that can live out their lives. And one step in that is going public. And it is a really important um, milestone that needs to happen. I think that um, the public market is a tough place for anything other than a multi-billion dollar company. And so the scale at which these businesses need to get to, to be successful in the public markets, takes time. Uh, and, you know, I think the interesting question to explore really is, is like, what's it going to take to bring back the small and mid-cap market in the public markets? Because that would be a big boost for capitalism and obviously venture and right. companies we've Yeah, had. or like, I mean, when Amazon went public, they had tiny revenues. Well, in the, the 90s and the 80s, it. like, or right. the, so now yeah, the market's like, be at $600 million before you can go public. That's a really high bar. So I think, yeah, hopefully there'll be more warming to actually companies that actually will grow as public companies. I mean, one thing I think to look forward to, and I'll, I'm sorry to talk so much, but just, I love this topic, <laughs> um, is that the companies right now have, they're, they're metal tested. They have been through so much the last couple of years. So I suspect we're going to have a really great class of companies going public in the next, I don't know, I don't want to call the time frame, but hopefully in the next 24 months, there's a bunch to point to that are really mature and able to shine in the public markets. And maybe that will continue to bring more people to the public market. I'm going to come to you next. About 40% of VCs just disappeared from the market last year, um, not doing a single deal. You all stayed in the game. Um, want to hear from you, Are? When you think about placing bets, how much more cautious are you right now? And to what extent are you looking for there to be an AI component to any business that you invest in? Absolutely. Um, we started seven years ago to invest in automation for the real economy. And automation and AI are basically synonymous. So that has been um, a part of what we look for from the beginning. Um, we really never stop. And you know, as the old saying goes, the best, money to, the best time to deploy is when everyone else is on the sidelines. We have actually been extremely busy the last 24 months. Um, we think the rate of company creation is at all times high. Uh, we love to quote this number of an analysis we did. 
10 years ago, if you wanted to see every deal in Silicon Valley, that was about eight deals a day. Today is 120 deals a day. So they're out there. People are not going to stop creating. Um, and I think it's fantastic news that with the IPO coming back to market and with AI, more and more dollars are coming into the game. There's a popular New Yorker cartoon about how, you know, just change your change the language from crypto in your <laughs> in, in, in your in your documents to, to say AI. Aileen Kirsten, how are you making decisions about, you know, whether something truly has artificial intelligence, generative AI, for example, woven into its into its products versus people who are just using that as window dressing? There is a lot of, I will say, there's a lot of window dressing going on right now. Um, I would, you know, a lot of investors got into the business in the last five or eight years, and they kind of got trained on this incredible velocity of making quick decisions, not doing a ton of diligence, being very momentum driven, even at earliest stages. I do think that is going to burn us because we're definitely seeing that again in AI. Uh, I think uh, it's funny. I was thinking a little bit about like what was going on in AI like, what does it seem like in terms of other tech waves that we've had? And I think that there are parallels to mobile. Um, when the iPhone came out in 07 and the App Store came out in 08, which is not that long ago, I don't know if you guys remember how many app companies oh there were God. that got funded by VCs and how few of them are still around. Uh, and it actually took a couple years, like whether it was Instagram or Snapchat or Uber, Airbnb, they did not come out the year after the iPhone or even two years after the iPhone. A lot of them came out three, four, or five years later and they built. And I think we're in like, Chat GPT is less than two years old. I think a lot of the stuff that's going on, especially in the application layer, um, is that like super buzzy, like feeding frenzy. And a lot of those things are not gonna be around in five years. And that we're actually, the really big companies are gonna be breakout hits. And probably a lot of them are actually gonna be consumer or actually haven't even been started yet. I mean, I think that, yeah, that's the path to progress, right? Which is it's kind of messy and rocky yeah. in, in order to, <clears throat> to get to the stuff that, that really works, that really gets adoption. I think you've got to try a lot of things and let a lot of things uh, fly and maybe not work. Now that's a, we are investing in AI. <laughs> we have been investing yeah. in AI. And it's actually hard. Um, it's to actually understand the industry, train on industry data, and then the, I think the key is because it's kind of be a race to the bottom in terms of the AI. You have to figure out what is the business process. How do you actually get cut into the business process, which is, I think, a key to it. I fully agree. Um, so we're in an interesting position because I actually uh, I run an AI company 10 years ago before becoming a venture capitalist. And initially, when we're getting a lot of pitches, the founders will focus on, I'm using this model. My AI is better because X, Y, Z. And finally, about 18 months ago, we had a rule. And it's like, when someone comes to pitch, they actually cannot talk about the AI. Let's only have them talk about what problem they are solving. So we'll be like, OK, don't tell me about the model. What do you actually do? It's like, oh, I help veterinaries <laughs> detect cancer in dogs. I help people in Nigeria transfer money. I help small businesses in the middle of America uh, be protected from fraud. By the way, here is how I do it. And that has been extremely helpful in separating people that are actually solving an actual problem from what we think is a race to the bottom. Yeah. You all three raised funds in the last couple of years at a time when some VCs had a hard time um, getting LPs on board. Talk about the changing conversation between yourselves and your LPs. What kinds of demands are they making? What kinds of pre precautions are they looking for? And specifically, are you having to go back and say, the timetable needs to change? That maybe that 10-year horizon we need to think about differently. We'll start with you. Absolutely. Uh, we last raised about 18 months ago. We actually didn't even announce it. Uh, so my PR will probably tell me not to say <laughs> this here. Um, and our fund was about 50% bigger than our prior one. We had tremendous support for our LPs. And we basically had the same conversations, but very focused on the long term. Very, very focused on the long term. Um, saying like, hey, when we started seven years ago, automation for the real economy is even bigger now. Um, and we basically had 100% re rate. Um, so again, we think it's about staying a little bit out of the cycles and focusing on the long term vision. 
I mean, in general, I think it's fair to assume that LPs are in a bit of the same boat that the GPs are in. It's an ecosystem that works together, which is we put a lot of capital to work over the last 10 years and the last few years in particular, and we haven't gotten a lot back at the same rate. There's a dip where we are right now. And so that makes you, you know, kind of revisit your criteria, recommit to the things that you feel like are purse principles, and underwrite with that in mind. And so, you know, I think it's fair to assume that, like, we've all moved our bars around up. Um, I think they are, too. We see, uh, speaking, staying on LPs and fundraising, we saw Andreessen just last month raise a collection of funds totaling $7.2 billion. At the same time, we're seeing some VCs really strug struggling, if not closing their doors entirely, um, saying they can't compete um, on early deals with these multi-stage firms. Um, are we going to continue to see a deepening divide between the haves and have-nots when it comes to venture capital firms? I, Start with you, I don't know if it's haves and have-nots, but it's strategy, right? There's this saying, like, your fund size is your strategy. I think there are, we, we are, our strategy is to be disciplined, to be curated. We are not a volume shop, and we're not building what you call an AUM, an assets under management shop. And so our, our strategy at Cowboy is to deliver out, like, what venture returns. So very high multiple of money and, and hopefully correspondingly high IRR. Um, I think the LPs that are investing in firms that are high, that are basically building assets under management, they are looking for a different return pro profile, and they're looking to invest a different quantity of money. Um, and so I feel like there is, no, a, it's not, it's more like a barbell going on, where you've just got shops that, that have, that are just managing tons of money with lots of people, um, and the people may change, and the LPs are buying a different product than probably the product than, that, we, that we are focused on. I've, go ahead. I fully agree with that. I'll say that that is also true for the founders. Yes. Founders are becoming a lot savvier, and we often make the pitch when like, hey, if we give you a $10 million check, that really matters for us. Um, someone that is managing 80 billion gives you a $10 million check, it's going to matter, but it's going to be a little bit different. And often, because we work very, in a very involved way with these companies, we want funds like Cowboy, like Forerunner, they are with us that have kind of the same alignment. Almost every deal we write about, or many of the deals we write about, there's always someone, you know, there's always a player in the Middle East, part of it. We're seeing that more and more. Um, I'm curious for you in this community, what impact is the, uh, what I consider to be a pretty big influx of Middle Eastern money, whether it's sovereign wealth funds, et cetera, on the investing community, and is it contributing to a soft bank, soft bank like bubble? I will put you on the spot. Sorry, put me on the spot. Well, I, I will just say that Forerunner has a um, an institutional investor base, all U.S. based, and I think we've you know also had a dedicated strategy. We really invest in the U.S. and we've kept our LPs in the U.S., so haven't been part of those conversations. I think it's about yeah that the money has the money has influence. The money has a role in all of this. Um, but really, they're picking their GPs that are out there making the decisions for them. So it's, it's, it's as much or more, I, I think, tied to the first question, which is like, what's just the impact of the, the, the large, large funds versus the more kind of traditional size venture funds? Yeah, I would agree. I think there's just, the genie is not going to go back in the bottle in terms of how much money has come into the venture category, because there's still more coming, both from sovereigns and other countries, pension funds who have not had exposure. And so all of us, I think, have had to adjust our strategies because, you know, valuations, especially at early stages, have gotten pretty high, and I think they're probably going to stay pretty high. Um, but, you know, and, and capital efficiency has gone down a lot. And so in terms of the returns that funds or LPs, but also founders and employees are going to make could be very different if companies are not careful with how much they raise and who they raise it from. Yeah, I, I think you, you know, I said all of that, but also you just can't ignore that, like, who you're making money for. Yes. Um, and what might be the next order of impact because of that. And yeah. I think as an industry, we, we need to, we need to be forward looking about that. Yeah. We're seeing regulators, come back to you, Ade, we're seeing regulators um, really cracking down on even smaller deals. Yeah. Um, the kinds of deals that would have just 
been woven, we've woven through uh, uh, a few in recent years. Give me a sense of you know what that's what that means for potential exits for your portfolio companies, and at what stage does shutting down deals in the name of innovation actually maybe circumvent that a little bit by cutting off some, cap some capital and some abilities to scale for some of these? Absolutely. Um, it's a complicated question. I'm going to be biased. Um, before becoming a VC, um, I saw two companies, one to Telefonica, one to Workday. I benefited tremendously. It allows me to do what I do today. Um, on the other hand, uh, it is pretty hard to start a hardware company today and compete with Apple. And that is true. Uh, when we think about it, we think about the definition of market in a monopoly. And we think that is the real question that needs to be answered uh, on a day and age in which there are a few companies that, you know, uh, for better or worse, have a lot of power and a lot of eyeballs. I want to stay with you for just a moment. Um, 75% of startups fail. Um, you've all had them. Um, <laughs> what are you talking about? Wanna, wanna, <laughs> wanna hear from you, uh, takeaways um, from some of the big ones. To start with you, uh, fresh in everyone's mind is FTX. Talk a little bit about some of your learnings from that experience. No, I'll, I'll talk about that and I'll talk about failure in general. Um, I think in a post FTX world, um, and at a post move fast in deploying money world, um, governance is key. We cannot lose sight of it. We are not only investors, we're stewards of capital. Uh, we're making money for very long-term thinking institutions and uh, taking a moment to really insist in governance control is extremely, extremely important. Please. I want to come to uh, one other thing that's top of mind for me during the uh, during the Me Too movement, you both, Kirsten and Aileen, um, worked getting all raise um, off the ground. Um, there's been some success, and there's also a lot of setbacks, and we haven't seen as much progress as I think you all had hoped there would be. Why are we not seeing as much progress in that area, getting more women and female-led uh, startups into the ecosystem? My gosh, do we have another half an hour? Mm. Um, we've made some progress. Yeah, you've got, you've got, you've got some good stats. Yeah, so we, you when we started all day. raise together, yeah, when we started all raise, 75% uh, of venture firms had not a single woman partner. And uh, women were only 8% of the partner ranks. So we have made some progress. So we're now at 16% women, which is doubling. And we started about five years ago. So that's good, but it's still quite pathetic. Uh, and so it's still, and I think it's something like 62% of venture firms have still not a single woman. And, and at the time, we didn't have data around people of color and other kinds of minorities. So we have a lot of room for improvement, and we cannot let up because there are cultural currents that are, you know, I've heard executive recruiters say when they're talking to maybe earlier generation managing partners at firms saying like, ah, DEI had its moment. I'm so glad that's over. It's not. Uh, you know, I think the... Tech industry is an incredibly powerful industry that changes lives, it changes who gets elected, it changes the content that we see and how we think, and so we have to have more representation around the table shaping our society. That's a great note to end on. Thank you so much, Aileen, Kirsten, and Ade.